Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Over the years, I've talked about a lot of rockets. I mean, while the US only has a handful of operational launch vehicle, there has been hundreds of different designs over the decades and around the globe. Not all rockets were successful, many made it to orbit, and some of them were among the ugliest pieces of engineering to ever come out of a discipline where sleek designs are supposed to be required for aerodynamic reasons. I mean, there's limits as to what you can reasonably do with rocket designs due to the laws of physics. And rocket design is usually a team effort, which means if you want to churn out an ugly launch vehicle, you have to actually assemble an entire team of aesthetically challenged engineers and have them fight against the natural tendency for rockets to look cool. So anyway, as a break from digging into the math or physics or history or engineering, I just wanted to highlight some of the greatest sins in the field of rocket design. If you are a student of aerospace engineering, then consider these next few minutes to be some examples of things not to do. So, in no particular order, let's start with the Atlas Able. I'm sorry, but this looks like a massive mutant bowling pin or something. This was early on in the life of the Atlas when they were trying to adapt it into a launch vehicle. And while the Atlas could reach orbit on its own, they wanted to then send a spacecraft past the moon. So the engineers took the second and third stages from the vanguards and put them on top of the much more powerful Atlas booster. So yeah, there's a whole joke in here, by the way, about you know how helicopters fly because they're so ugly the ground repels them. Clearly this doesn't apply to rockets because for the Atlas Able, two of them never made it off the ground because of static failures and three failed in flight and that was a 100% perfect unsuccessful launch record. Granted, there was the similar Thor Able design which you know you did the same idea but used a Thor. The Thor booster is a little skinnier so it looks a lot re less ridiculous and yet it does have the benefit of being successful. Let's be clear though, a rocket could be highly successful and still staggeringly ugly at the same time, such as the Ariane 4. Now the first four iterations of Ariane were never elegant. Uh, the size difference between the stages, the fairing shape, the conical extensions covering the engines that helped the aerodynamics but to the detriment of the looks. The Ariane 4 specifically had the option to use two different types of strap-on boosters on the first stage. And in the case of the AR44LP, it had a pair of fat liquid boosters and two skinny solid boosters to create something that is aesthetically jarring on many levels. But this configuration launched many times, 25 successful launches. The other highly successful rocket which never looked elegant to me was the Proton. For me it's like Soviet architecture in rocket form. And I know a lot of people like it and it has launched many historic payloads but I've never got over the disappointment of realising that first stage isn't surrounded by strap-on boosters. That design is all bolted together on the ground and they use that because the seven tanks have to fit on a, you know rail transport and they couldn't do anything bigger. Apparently at one point during testing they actually filled this whole thing with vodka so maybe that explains why the engineers were happy to overlook the aesthetic shortcomings of it. Here's the thing though, the Proton was known as the UR500, Universal Rocket, and it was actually pretty tame compared to the UR700 or the UR900, which just kept on bolting tanks together at random until they had something that was supposed to go to the moon or even Mars. So consider that had the US not won the moon race in 1969, one of these monstrosities might have been built if the N1 kept failing. There's some alternate history out there where people are praising the Proton and the UR700 as the rocket that brought us to the moon. Whew. Okay, number four is OTRAG system, which was supposed to be made of clusters of pipe-like thrust elements. This was an interesting idea to bring rocket costs down by standardizing all the parts and clustering them together. Unfortunately, to scale the idea up, the result looked like a bundle of drinking straws or in one case, a giant silver office block. I mean, the goal was to make it look cheap or make it cheap, but not make it look good. Uh, OTRAG was of course somewhat notorious for projects linked to African dictators. And of course, the top tier dictators like to get their hands on ballistic missiles, but what if you took a bunch of Scud missiles and bundled them together to make a multi-stage rocket? 
That's what was tried by Iraq in the late 1980s. They'd actually started a civilian satellite program and were trying to get it flown on an Ariane 4, but deteriorating international relations meant that it was impossible. So instead, they began to develop their own launch vehicles based on the Scud missile. Unfortunately, the only images I have of this are terrible from your know, grainy videotapes and old UN reports, but the drawings I have show a classic example of what happens in Kerbal Space Program when you've only unlocked the small fuel tanks and engines, but you need a big launch vehicle. It was built around six modified Scud missiles, five in the first stage, one in the second stage, and then a third stage, which was probably also adapted from another missile. There was only one test flight of this and it had a dummy second and third stage, but it looks like it failed after 45 seconds, possibly because the stage separation system fired early or it lost the will to live. They did actually demonstrate that they could make this monstrosity fly, but before they progressed to another flight, there was that whole Gulf War thing, and afterwards, Iraq was forced to give up its long-range missiles to stop them doing bad things with them. At the time, we thought that meant threatening their neighbours, but it might equally have been to stymie their engineers who thought that the Al-Abid was a good idea. Clustering together small rockets to make a bigger rocket has also seen in the US, in the form of the Conestoga 1620, which looks like a bunch of white crayons held together with black rubber bands. I guess the rocket builders were planning on getting a bulk discount on Castor 4 solid rocket motors because they used seven in the first stage, uh, seven in the rocket, sorry. They, they would ignite four, then two, and then one as it ascended. They actually had a number of different designs based on the same idea, but this was the only one that ever flew. To its credit, while the rocket looked squat and ugly on the launch pad, when it finally flew, failed and was aborted, it did produce some very pretty patterns in the sky as the still burning boosters went their separate ways. The polar opposite of this is a rocket with a single big solid rocket booster. That is the Ares X-1, which has a big solid rocket booster from a space shuttle with a boilerplate on top that was supposed to represent the planned Hydrolox upper stages and the Orion capsule. So this has the effect of making it resemble a snake that has consumed a substantial meal and is now going to spend the next week digesting it. It looks upside down with a fatter stage on the front. A lot of this is because of the equally ugly politics that tried to push this as a cargo vehicle for the ISS instead of the commercial vehicles which would take flight a year later. So far, it's the only shuttle-derived launch vehicle to actually fly, even if it was cancelled before it could launch again. There are a lot of different shuttle-derived launch vehicle concepts which never made it off paper. Uh, which means technically they don't qualify for this, but I'm including a couple because technically parts of them did actually fly as boosters on the space shuttle. And you know, they're eyesores that leap off the pages of these white papers. The SRB-X has been described as the single worst shuttle-derived launcher ever proposed. It was a proposal for a geostationary orbit-capable booster for the Air Force, and it probably started out as a sensible idea to build a rocket using the shuttle boosters to boost another core uh, with a shuttle booster on it, and then extra upper stages, but they wanted to reduce costs by using the existing shuttle launch pads. So the boosters had to be the same distance apart on the pad as they would be if they were attached to the space shuttle's external tank. And this means that the booster cluster looks like they're trying to stay as far away from each other while working together, kind of like they're embarrassed. Or maybe they sort of developed some sort of social distancing protocol for rockets. Needless to say, this concept lost out to the Titan. And then there was the Jupiter 3, laid out by Team Vision Incorporated in a 2006 paper. It was a Franken rocket which is served with a massive helping of Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. This monster heavy lift vehicle would have a core with a pair of shuttle external tanks, and each of those would have their own pair of shuttle boosters attached. The bottom of the core would have a set of RS-68 engines, which would be fueled from the external tanks, which meant that a whole lot dropped off during staging. After that, they would have another couple of core stages and a massive fairing for 160 tons of payload. In the art, they make it look like a pair of space shuttles launching the first stage of a Saturn V, which might sound cool to some. I I'm sorry, it's, it's not. For the final few ugly rockets, let's scale back our dreams and look at some rockets that were never designed to go to space. First up, 
the Navajo cruise missile, an early design for a nuclear cruise missile, which just looks ridiculously ungainly on the launch pad. It had a rocket booster to get it up to speed, and then this would drop away and let the supersonic ramjets do the work to bring the payload to the target. If you separated the cruise missile from the booster, it actually did look kind of cool, but we're talking about the full package here. Because it was a test program, many of the missiles were painted bright colours to make them easy to see, which doesn't really improve on the random mess of wings, engines and intakes that was the Navajo. It never entered service because the Atlas ICBM could do the same thing in less time. Even before this, we have the V-2 Hermes, which put ramjets on top of a V-2 rocket with a monster wedge-shaped wing. That forced them to add even bigger fins on the bottom of the V-2 for stability. And this uh, rocket actually caused a bit of an international incident when uh, during one launch it started going the wrong way and the range safety officer was unable to terminate the flight because one of the rocket designers physically restrained him. The rocket ended up flying into Mexico and leaving a substantial crater near an airfield. It probably didn't help that the engineers had recently been brought over from Germany as part of Operation Paperclip. Finally, to show that nothing is sacred here. Goddard's historic achievements in rocketry should not let us forget that not only did his first rocket design look bad, but it was ass backwards with the engines at the top and the fuel tank at the bottom because he thought that this would be more stable. Yes, the guy that literally invented rocket science also fell for the pendulum rocket fallacy, but I can forgive him for this misstep on the way to making history. Unlike me, he didn't have Kerbal Space Program to experiment with first. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.